we've got this project then that it's still lacking some content, but structure-wise I think it's set up pretty well. And uh, we've got a project that's coming along. Based on the example project, I want to talk about some JavaScript because I want to, for example, deal with customization of the app. I want the user to be able to input uh, their name, and then their name is used throughout the app to personalize the, the app. So that's going to be a bunch of JavaScript. JavaScript is the interactivity, is the behavior layer. We're going to create a button on the About screen that will ask the user to personalize the project. It will ask them in a pop-up, what's your name? It'll take that name and then put that name throughout the project. So that's JavaScript. First we'll create the button, we'll go back to the index file, we'll go all the way to, to the bottom where you've got the About section. Let's see, article, paragraph, we'll fill in that content later. Below that we will create uh, a button called Personalize. A tag around that. It's a button, you should know what to do, so it's going to have an href. We'll explain what the the href goes a little later, so pound sign. Um, but uh, data role, you know, we've seen this before. This should not be... Um, different. So the same as before, some kind of icon, data dash icon. You can do user. You've got an icon with a little person so that they can uh, get the sense that this will personalize the app. And right off the bat, oftentimes we're going to be using an ID when we have a button. We can use an ID or a class. Oftentimes it'll be an ID because this particular button will launch this particular JavaScript code. This particular JavaScript code will be triggered by this particular button. So an ID will mean it's this particular button and no other button. We can call this something like btn personalize. That's a lot of writing. btn name. Any name will work, of course, but that'll be fine. If you want to see what it looks like, it should be no, no big mystery, but we'll have a button in the About screen to have the user personalize. The rest then comes in JavaScript. So confirm that this line here is set up properly. There's our button. We're going to jump over to our JavaScript file and write some JavaScript. So in the JavaScript file, put your custom code here, Codica.js. Make sure you're in the JS file. <laughs> not in the CSS file, of course. We're not writing CSS, we're writing JavaScript. Make sure you're in codica.external.js. Um, we've, don't write this, but we've been writing document.getElementById to target a specific ID. We have the ability to use shortcuts in our JavaScript because we've got jQuery. jQuery is the library of shortcuts where we can write less and do more. So now we will be able to write this. This is going to be pretty much equivalent. Writing this, this is our jQuery selector. We're going to select something in the HTML file. This dollar symbol only works so writing it in the shortcut only works when you've got jQuery mobile, some version, 1x, 2x, 3x, whatever. Within the parentheses, we're saying, okay, what element are we talking about? Document.getElementById. We would supply the ID, and it would know, oh, you mean that ID. This, we need to then, in quotes, say what element. Pound, b 
btn name. That's that ID that exists in the HTML file. So that line of like 20 characters is summed up in 7 because of jQuery. Write less, do more. Um, this is referencing an object. When we first started to talk about JavaScript, we talked that it's a that it's an object-oriented programming language. It deals with objects. It lets us manipulate objects. It lets us reference objects. So here, basically, we were creating a a reference to an object, and we have a method which is in a, an action. Do something about this object. And we have a jQuery method called on. Oops dot on so we have the object there's some object on the screen btn name and let's activate let's use the on method let's run a uh, the, the on command uh, well on is further defined with a couple of of arguments here, a couple of parameters, a couple of arguments saying, okay, on what type of action do what specifically? We're going to say something's going to happen once we click this button, have it ask for the user's name and such, a bunch of steps. So we'll start off with quotes, click, on the event of a click of that object. So on the event of a click on that object, comma, Uh, we're going to invoke a result or a set of steps, a function. Open close parentheses, open close curly brace. We're going to see this. Um, we're going to see this way of it being written several times. Functions are collections of steps because we need to do several things here when the button is clicked. Just very, very quickly to make sure we're on our on the right track. Inside the curly braces, we'll call the good old alert um, method. Alert is supposed to make a very simple pop-up box. So we're saying on the event of clicking that button, run this code. Alert. Save it and run it. Go back to your About screen and click the button. And you should get a pop-up that says, we clicked. Let's see, so I'm going to refresh my code. Go to About, click Personalize pop-up, we clicked. So that button now has been activated. There's here what you would call an event listener. This is an event, a click. We can go look up all of the list of events, of course. There's the click event, there's the double click event, click and drag, there's the tap, there's swipe, there's pinch and zoom, there's all of these events that we can go look up at jQuery.com. This is a very simple one. When you click this thing, do something. And the something is run a function with these steps. We could write all of the steps that we need. You know, we could semicolon more steps, semicolon more steps. This is going to look very cumbersome. So what's most commonly done at this point here is we, we call, we activate, we run a function that we define with all of our steps. So we're going to run a function called getName. We're going to run a command called getName. GetName is not a default built-in jQuery or JavaScript command. We're going to invent this. And the confusing thing is that there's like, let's say, a hundred commands in JavaScript. And jQuery has shortcuts for all of them, and it has its own that it invented. 
So the confusing thing is, well, am I activating JavaScript code? Am I using jQuery code? Am I using my own code that I invented? This is a whole new kind of worms. That's why this is the third level. This is the hardest one. We have many more things to deal with in JavaScript. So uh, for all intents and purposes for the moment, what we're doing here is we're about to run a JavaScript command called getName that we are going to invent. Next line. Function get name, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. We're about to define, we're about to explain what get name is. We don't need to explain what alert is. That's defined deep in the bowels of the jQuery language. It just works. We need to define what does get name mean, what does it do. We don't need to define what this dollar symbol selector does. That's in the jQuery JS file. We don't need to define what dot on does, but we need to define what get name does. I'm going to break these curly braces into multiple lines because I'm going to have multiple things to do here. Console log. We clicked again. Save it and run it. And check that result. So if, it, if this works, you will see a message that says we clicked again in the console. We need to get used to looking at the console. When we get to complex JavaScript, we're going to make errors. So I'm going to reload my code. I'm going to press F12 to bring over, open my developer's console, go to about, click on personalize, we clicked. Click it again and it'll tell you, you clicked it twice, three times, whatever times. You're not going to see a pop-up, we didn't ask for a pop-up. We're saying give me console output, give me results in the developer's console. And there it is, I clicked it 28 times, 29 times. So let's pause here. Are people getting console log out?
All right, so what this is doing, it's showing us that that button is active and we're able to click it and something happens. So what we want is to ask the user for some input. We have a built-in JavaScript uh, command that'll do that called prompt. We can get more fancy later, but if we go to the next line and type prompt, So we have a JavaScript command called prompt, and then inside of the prompt, we give it the arguments of a message. So we can say, um, enter name, if you want to be mechanical, or say, what's your name? Tell us your name. You can write whatever you want here. But I'm saying here, enter, enter name. Save it and run it, and you'll see here then a pop-up, but a pop-up that asks, enter your name, and a little box for people to type into. Try that. Prompt. Enter name. Notice that we are writing a semicolon at the end of most lines. Um, I'll point out when we don't. One of them is right here. This is just the way it is. We have to remember that when we write function and we define our function, open curly brace close, we could put a semicolon there, but it's best practice not to. Just memorize that. But almost everywhere else, we have a semicolon at the end of the line, end of statement. And so our result should be, let me refresh this. I'll go back there, personalize, pops up, pops up there, enter name. It's still saying that we clicked part, of course, because that line still exists. But now we've got a pop-up that says enter name, so if I type my name, I can click OK or I can click Cancel. If I click OK, nothing happens. If I click Cancel, nothing happens. We further haven't programmed anything more. This is the example again that the difficulty of being a programmer is because you have to deal with a computer and the computer doesn't know what you want, you have to be very specific. All we said was make a pop-up to ask for the name. We didn't say anything about store that name, use that name, do something with that name. So we're going to create a container to hold that name. We've done this before. We've created containers. There's a container that will hold whatever the person types. So what we'll do is we'll back up to the beginning of this line and we'll type VAR that will create a variable that will create a container and we will call that username space equals equals is the assignment operator we're assigning here when when the web browser gets to this line in the code 
it'll scan the line and it'll see, let's create a container, a variable called username, and let's fill it. Let's assign to it the result of prompt. Whatever the person types, as soon as they click OK, put that into that variable. So to see that result, we'll do console log. We can be doing alerts to pop up on screen. But let's get used to the console here and say username, not in quotes. In quotes, it's a string, it's a, it's a literal. In quotes, is literally write this. No quotes is saying, show me the contents of what's in that variable. Show me the contents of that object. So no quotes. Save it and run it. Type something into the box and see in your console, you get output of what you typed. Every time you type something new and click enter, it shows you new output in the console. Let's see, I'm going to refresh my project. Go back here, personalize, I'll type my name, click OK, and then the console says my name. Mm -hmm. Type in as many things as I want, and it'll show up in the console. Um, when we did that, a couple of weeks ago, our first intro to JavaScript, uh, there were input boxes on screen that were visible. We clicked the button, it stored a name, so this is not completely new. The difference is that we're using prompt to ask for the person's content in a pop-up. So now the person's name is saved to a variable and that name will stay there until it's replaced by something else or we close the web browser. If this were an app, eventually when we get it to be an app, that name would stay there as long as the app is running in memory. So if we shut down the app, when it's an app eventually, it'll forget the name. And here with the web browser as well, as long as we've got the, the browser running, it remembers that name. Well, I, I wanted to remember it, sure, but I want to use it so that when a person uh, comes here, it'll say, welcome, Victor. It'll be over here, something like, take an art class, Victor. I wanted to go to the computers and say, take a computer class, Victor. I want it to use that name that we wrote on screen. So we're going to replace code that exists in HTML with code that we're asking the user. Let's get back to our, our index.html file and uh, let's go over actually to the art screen. It still says heading. What line is that on? Over on one line, line 119. Uh, we'll, we'll have it say for the moment again, uh, just the basic text of uh, take an art class. And I have those sentences throughout my project, those headings, uh, where I want to insert the user's name at that point. I need some sort of like anchor or target so that I can insert um, that name from JavaScript into the screen. So let's start at the home screen first. We've got the first welcome. I want to say welcome, Victor. So I will put a little placeholder here to then fill it with what the person types. And we have, we, we have the placeholder that we've seen before of div, but we're not going to use a div in this case uh, because it's a block level element. Instead, uh, we're going to use something else called a span. 
Span is sort of like the little brother of div, except that a div wants to take up as much space as it can on, on one line. Guys? Guys? Uh, I know you're helping each other, but if you can say if you can help fight it, please. So if I had div here, div would push itself to its own line and take up its own amount of space. We don't want that because then it'll say, welcome, next space, Victor. I want it on the same one space. So that's what a span will do. It'll let me use the same inline element. Uh, but we should give this uh, some sort of unique identifier. And we're going to want to use this multiple times. So which would work best to use multiple times? Class, yes. So we use a class here. ID could only be used once per our whole project. We want our name to be used multiple times per project. So we'll call this uh, class and we'll give it a name of, um, let's say, welcome message. So copy this whole chunk right here. This is what, what this is our placeholder to display our name, the user's name, anywhere throughout our project. I want to have it say, welcome, Victor, here. And I want it to say, take an art class, Victor, on that screen. And I want to say, take a computer class, Victor, on that screen. So go find your other screens where, where that would make sense. Over on the art screen, it's on line 119. I'll just paste that in exactly as it is. In theory, that'll say, take an art class, John. And then we'll find uh, the one on the computer's screen. One line 193 or so. Uh, paste that in there. This span placeholder with a unique identifier. Well, we are using the identifier welcome message more than once, but that's okay. We will to take advantage of that to write the same name multiple times. If we go back to save this file, and we'll go back now to the JavaScript. We have a way to ask for the name, we have a way to save the name, now we need a way to display the name on screen. We have a placeholder to display that name, those names. So back to the JavaScript. This is still inside of the function of get name because a function is a set of steps we're doing many steps once we click the button do all of these steps next step make sure you're still in the curly brackets we will use the jQuery selector we're gonna select something in our HTML file the something in quotes is dot welcome message however you spelled it. We had uh, document.getElementById was the long hand. The shorthand is that. We also had, we didn't use it, but we have document.getElements by class names. That wants to get all the class names. Shorthand is dollar and then the class name. Um, that's that's an object, so we can apply various methods to it. And one method is HTML. We're going to write some HTML in this object. There are three of them that exist in our document. Let's write some HTML there. Just to see how it works. Username. We'll, we'll need to clean it up. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's save and run this. And in theory here, asking for the name, storing the name, displaying the name in the placeholder. Give that a try. Let's see, I'm going to personalize 
filter. I'll click OK. You need to close that about screen. Of course, it's in your way, so I'll close that. Welcome, Victor. Take in our class, Victor. Take computer class, Victor. Close. It is taking my name and showing it on screen, but it doesn't look nice. Wouldn't it normally have a space between words? And maybe to be grammatically correct, I might want to have a comma there. And maybe to be enthusiastic, I could put an exclamation mark. <coughs> so we have a little bit of cleanup that we need to do here. Because simply, this did exactly what we told it. Display that name in that spot. Nothing more. We do need more. The more will be that we will add a comma and a space and an exclamation point. And here we're saying display as HTML the contents of the variable, the user's name. As HTML, I want to display a comma and a space. So before username, we'll type in quotes, because then this will display as HTML, comma, space. So think about it. It's, it says welcome, and then comma space, Victor, and then exclamation point. But the syntax of it is that we need to display a little bit of a string, a little bit of text, and then a variable, and then a little bit more text. So in between, we need a plus. We're building a string, comma space, and then the variable. And then, so you can think of the pluses, and then quotes, exclamation point. Whatever message is already there, comma, space, person's name, exclamation point. Save and run that and see if it looks a little nicer. Should look a little nicer, hopefully, if you go back to about, put it on your name, check the result. Looks nicer. It looks like real words. It's like real planning. It looks real professional. We added to the output. This is a very common thing that we're going to be doing. We're going to be building a string, a little bit of text, plus some other kind of text, plus maybe a variable, plus an object or something, properties of an object. We're going to use this plus concatenation. We're going to build a string, output it as HTML in that element. So it's got a name. If you notice, if I refresh my browser, the name goes away. My console was also cleared. This is what I'm saying about the variable. It was stored as long as we don't refresh, as long as we don't um, reload. If this were an app on a device, it would remember the name and display it until perhaps you, you quit the app you shut it down, you restarted your phone, it might remember very temporarily. So this variable is great for temporary things, but it's not so good perhaps for um, more permanent things. So we have some JavaScript that we can write that we can create more permanent uh, objects. This var, this variable, is kind of temporary. So we have an HTML5 uh, construct in JavaScript that we can use through JavaScript called local storage. This is like creating a cookie. When you visit a website, 
and you log in and you click the button to say remember me well it leaves a cookie on your computer that remembers you for your convenience we can do something like that here but not the classic kind of web browser cookie this is a little bit more powerful it can store more data it's more uh, more, more permanent so take a little detour here briefly if you open up your web browser you do a search for HTML5 local storage local storage is one word we'll go look at the specification for a moment you get plenty of results of course uh, I'll look at the one at w3schools.com so HTML5 local storage HTML5 local storage tutorial we'll take a quick look at that HTML local storage better than cookies. What is it? Um, web apps can store data locally within the user's browser. Uh, they had to be stored in cookies in the past. Server requests, all of that. Unlike cookies, the, the storage limit is five megabytes. So we can create as many of these local storage objects as we want. Each one's up to five megabytes. We can save a lot of different kinds of data. Um, it's, it gets saved to the browser itself rather than on the server, which makes the app perhaps a little bit more uh, responsive and doesn't affect site performance. So all the browsers ex work with it pretty well. Newer versions of Internet Explorer and so forth. Um, the way we would use it to store this object, to store this super cookie we would write local storage in that syntax, capitalization. This is basically JavaScript. We've got the local storage object dot method. We've got set item with two arguments. Um, the name of the cookie and the value of the cookie. So it's a simple key value pair. You see that very, very commonly on, on web projects. Key value. This means that. So we're storing, we're setting a local storage object. That's its name, so we can retrieve it, and that's what's stored in that. To get it back, it's this part right here, this part is something else. It's here, local storage that get item, the item with that key. We name them, we can retrieve them, we set the name, we get the name. Here it's then just displaying it on screen. That's document get element by id dot inner html. That's the same as us doing dollar results dot html. The point is get the cookie, get the local storage object, store it, retrieve it. There is also to delete it. Whenever we do set item, it stores it permanently. You close the web browser, you come back, it's still there. You turn it on or off your computer, it's still there. You completely uninstall the web browser, okay, that's when it gets deleted. But you never uninstall a web browser. Eventually, if we, this, we get it over to an app, again, it would be installed on the device, in the bowels of the app. And the data would be stored permanently. You uninstall the app, okay, then the data gets deleted. But if you wanted to manually delete the data, you've got remove item method of the local source object. Session storage, don't worry about that because that uh, is, is defeats the purpose, I think. It's just temporary storage. I don't want temporary, I want permanent storage. Well, we've also got um, shorthand. We've got local storage dot set item. Which item, what value? Shorthand is local storage dot what item, what value. So this saves a few bytes. And then to retrieve it, instead of local storage dot get item last name, you say local storage dot the name of the item. This is exactly equivalent as that, but it's less typing, which might be less errors, more efficient. So we're going to use the shorthand local storage, and then technically a property 
and then the value of that property is something. And then retrieve the object and the property. So tangibly for us, we're going to rewrite our code a little bit to store these variables a little bit more permanently. This method right here is the old way. It's too temporary. I'm going to comment out that line if you put double slashes at the beginning. I may not want to delete that. I may want to perhaps use it for some reason later. So I'll just comment it out, double slashes. And at the end of the line, I'll also put double slashes. So it's a comment in a comment. And I'll say here, um, store name via temporary variable. Because now we're going to do local storage. Store a name in a more permanent local storage object. The reason I put double slashes twice is that if I do want to reuse that code later on and I take away those slashes, this is still commented out over here. If I didn't put slashes over here, and I uncomment this code later, it thinks all of this is valid code, which is not. So my trick here is comment and a comment. Uh, we'll say instead local storage dot username. We've got the local storage object. We're going to create. We don't need to do set item. It's this is a shorthand. Local storage username. We're creating that object for permanent storage. The rest is the same. What data? It comes from prompt. Enter name. No need for var. It's not. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense here. We're saying local storage object. This property. This cookie. Fill it with the prompt. Okay, so what do we need to change next? Line 8. This is still referencing a variable which we are no longer using. On line 7, I'll comment that one out. That's trying to that's trying to reference a variable that we deactivated. Line 8. I'm going to copy that line and comment out the original. Because all of this code works, but we just need it to work with our new local storage object, not the old variable. So we can give myself a comment that would have been retrieve temporary variable. And so here, local storage dot username. That's the get item. Set item, get item. Shorthand. Set that item, get that item. Save that and run it. So I saved the name, it's retrieving it. It should be behaving as before. The point of this is that it's permanent. If I refresh it, I'm not quite there yet. It's still going away, but it is permanent. It is being stored 
in the web browser. Uh, let me show you this. Uh, Firefox isn't so good to show you this, but let's do this. Uh, go back to index. I've been running it in Firefox. If you've been running it in Chrome, that's good. Hold on a moment. If you have been running it in Firefox like me, let me show you this. Go back to your HTML and run in Chrome. Both Chrome and Firefox, all the browsers, will let you view the local storage objects, but I think over on Chrome it's a little easier to view. So load it up in Chrome, load up your console, F12, and you may see a tab called application at the top. If you, if you don't see application, if it's cut off like that, click the double arrow and you should see application. Under storage section, there's different ways to store data that this project is storing data, like cookies. Here's local storage. So if I have saved a name, if I've saved a name and I go look in my local storage, this the file is saving a username with a value. We can see that in Firefox. I, I always forget where that screen is, but in Chrome it's a little easier to find. If I uh, refresh my screen, it does go away from the screen, but looking at it in this the storage, it's still there. If I close my browser completely and run uh, Chrome again without typing any name yet, I go to my developer's console again, application, local storage, it still remembered it. That's what the local storage object is. It's, it's a variable that is more permanent. It's like a cookie, but it saves more space five megabytes. So a, a classic cookie saves like like a uh, hundred kilobytes or twenty kilobytes or something, a tiny amount of data. The part of it, why isn't it not displaying on screen? Well we never programmed that. We just told it, get a name, store a name, display a name. We didn't say, okay, next time the app loads up, get that name and show it on screen. We didn't say that. Again, we need to tell the computer exactly what to do at all times. But at least at this point, hopefully, if you're seeing it good, if not, you're seeing it, it's working and for me, it does work. At this point, we are storing the name permanently, we are able to retrieve it in a moment, uh, and we'll display it on screen. So this code so far is just to ask for the name. We haven't made any code to say, okay, if the name exists, show it then. Don't just show it the first time that the user types their name in. Show that name every single time they've typed their name. Don't forget to show the name on screen. So let's go to the end of our code, and now we'll go past the curly brackets. We're finished with this function, with this series of steps. We want to create a new function with a new set of steps. Function. We're defining a new function, which will be show name. We're making our show name command. We're inventing our show name command in JavaScript so that it will show a name. That name that the person has typed, show it. It did it the first time with this welcome message here, but only after we've clicked to save a name. This line 9, which shows the name with an initial click, copy that whole line 9 and paste it into your function of show name.
there's a series of steps that is get name. We invoke that function, we run that function, we use that function when there was a click on the button. We ran get name. This function here has been has been uh, created, but there's nothing that calls it. There's nothing that runs it or uses it. Next line, show name, function, end of statement. We've invented a function. It's only got one step, but this could have had a hundred steps. And then we're saying, okay, we invented that function. Let's use that function. It's not being triggered by anything. It's just going to run. There's no button that we need to press for it to do it. It'll just do it. When we call a function like that as is, it'll run through the steps that we've defined and it'll just do it. And that's the concept that I want. If I were to save a name, it'll show it. But if I close my browser and I open the browser again, the name should be there. Well, it will be because it'll run through all of the code, it'll get up to the step, and it'll say show name, it'll back up and show the name. Without my input, it'll do it automatically. Because we're simply saying run that function. Do it as soon as possible. If I run in Chrome or Firefox, go back to Firefox, welcome Anastasia. I typed that two minutes ago. It remembered. If I run it in Chrome, it should remember the other name I typed there. Welcome Emmett. Because this initial code saved that name, this other code here retrieved the name. If I add a different name, It, of course, shows it because that's what this does. Ask for the name, show the name once I've clicked. Well, if I refresh, you saw a moment ago refreshing deleted it. Not anymore. Because every time now I refresh, it goes through all my in index code and runs all of that. It goes through my code. CSS code and runs that. It goes to my JavaScript code line by line, and then it got to the line that says show the name. So it backs up and shows the name. That's what our code is doing here. It's not perfect yet. We're going to wrap up in a moment and have some lab time. It's not perfect yet because there are instances where other things could happen. Watch this. If I were to open that project in a different web browser where I've never stored a name, let me open it in Internet Explorer. There's no name there. Um, there's nothing to retrieve. And some browsers might even be more strict in that it'll say, perhaps, undefined because it's trying there it is undefined it's trying to retrieve it's it's doing get item there's no item to get I've never saved the name yet each browser is independent each browser is storing this local storage object independently of its of each other for security purposes so Chrome saved a certain name and that's separate from Firefox which is separate from Internet Explorer which is separate from Opera none can access each other's local storage objects. And so here, Chrome, this is the first time I use or Opera all day long, and it went to the line that says show name. So it got to the line of the code here. Look at the local storage object and the username and display it on screen. It, we never ran this part, so it's undefined. There is no name to display, so it's undefined. When we come back next time, we'll put polish on that. We have to deal with conditional statements. We have to deal with what if there is no name, do this. If there is a name, do that. We also have to deal with a little bit of user input. At the moment, I can type any crazy thing. And I'll say, welcome, any crazy thing. And maybe I want it to be a little bit smarter about that. Again, it won't know what we want until we program it. 
if I put in here a bunch of Yosemite Sam swear words, then it'll take it. Welcome you so-and-so, and it'll get stored. So we might want to strip out invalid characters and do better input detection and such. More JavaScript. Um, we're going to wrap the main lecture in just a moment. And this is where we're at so far in that we've added more of these content areas, a little bit of styling here and there, started to touch on some JavaScript interactivity. That needs still polish. We need more time than we have today. So we're going to wrap up the main lecture, but any general questions about what we've looked at today? I'm going to put my code in the network folder in just a moment, and then we'll do some lab time until 9.30. If you need any help, call me over. I'll put my, my work in there with today's date, so you can get a copy of what I did. If you want to con compare what you did with I did, or if you lost a little bit something there, my code is there. You just grab it. And so... You can go back to the network folder and you will see 927. So that's it for the moment. Um, remember to sign in if you came in a little bit late. Don't forget your stuff. When we come back on Thursday, we'll do some more JavaScript. And that will be the end of part one of the class.